You know, for a writer, a book tour can sometimes, for some writers, be a chastening thing, embarked on only reluctantly. I mean, it killed Dickens and wore out Mark Twain. Uh, and it puts one in mind of the apocryphal groom who, at his own wedding, was asked to uh, prepare toast, propose a toast to the bride. And totally unprepared, and he rises to his feet and puts a gentle hand on his bride's shoulder, and he says, Ladies and gentlemen, I, I don't know what to say. This has been forced upon me. <laughs> but in this case, I, I really feel none of those reservations. Uh, not only because, I feel none of these reservations, not only because this is a hometown audience, and I know some of you, um, but also because this subject, to me at least, is um, a serious one that is also in, just uh, uh, lends itself to a great deal of humor. Uh, I mean, how can you fault a magazine that is responsible for one of the great Woody Allen lines of all time? You know it all. I'm sure you remember the crack in Annie Hall, where Alvy says, you know, I'm so tired of spending evenings, you know, making f fake insights with people who work for dysentery. And Robin says, commentary. And Alvy says, oh, really? I thought that commentary and dissent had merged and formed dysentery. <laughs> uh, I wanted to spend uh, some time this evening telling you just about the book, how I came to write it, uh, picking up some of its, of its major themes, uh, and then opening the floor to questions. The first thing I can say about this book is that, uh, in a sense, it's a book born out of a certain ignorance. By that, I mean that it's, it, I think Lytton Strachey once said that ignorance is the first requisite of the historian. In other words, ignorance omits, selects, uh, simplifies, clarifies. And what I tried to do with this book is to say something about the American Jewish post-war experience. Now, that experience, in a sense, we know too much about it. Um, the community uh, has poured forth such a vast abundance of, of material that even the most industrious historians, I think, would be submerged by it. So what I plan to do with this book is to uh, attack the subject in some unexpected places, to sort of approach it from the flank, if you will. So to use another metaphor, I wanted to sort of row out over this ocean of, of post-war experience and dip a bucket in here and there, uh, which would bring to the light of day some characteristic sample or the other um, to be examined with some kind of curiosity. And the bucket that I use, so to speak, is, to my mind, one of the best, and that is Commentary Magazine. Why commentary is useful as a vessel, is first of all, is that I work there as a relatively lowly editor. Uh, I started to work there uh, just a couple of weeks before 9-11. It was a fascinating time to be there. But when I say lowly, I mean also lowly in the sense that Al Pacino worked in the mailroom of Commentary Magazine when he was a young man. And after all, he went on to some better things. <laughs> But also, I think that even objectively, so to speak, uh, commentary provides sort of an ideal barometer of the American Jewish experience. Um, so in a sense, this book sort of aims to, to work on two levels. On one level, it's a, it's a brief history of commentary from 1945 to the present. Not the official portrait, perhaps, but at least one uh, picture of a journalistic institution in transition. Uh, in that sense, it's sort of a family drama about three generations of uncommonly articulate and uncommonly influential uh, and uncommonly opinionated, too, a uh, group of so-called New York intellectuals who sort of stood astride what Lionel Trilling famously called the bloody crossroads where politics and literature meet. In that sense, it also provides a portrait, it proceeds um, by, by providing a portrait of the three editors of commentary. The first, the founding editor, Elliot Cohen, the second, Norman Podhoritz, and the third, Neil Kozadoy, each brilliant in his own way. But on a second level, uh, as I say, this is a vessel. I use the magazine for all its intrinsic interest as a vessel to bring up from the depths some, some interesting facets of the American Jewish story. Because my thesis in the book is that the story of commentary lies coiled within uh, this larger story about how Jews over the last half century or so embraced America and how in turn they were changed by that embrace. So I think that 
I, I hope that you'll agree with me after reading the book that it's not much of a stretch to say that you can, it's possible to read commentary as a m sort of single multi-volume text, a record of decades of give and take about how these, these Jews were negotiating their relationship with a larger country. Um, and in, 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 in doing so, it's possible to trace, in essence, the whole post-war uh, history of the American Jewish experience. Now, uh, the reason commentary is so central is that it, it taught that there need to be no contradiction between uh, Jewish particularism, I would say, and a full participation in the larger culture. So commentary from the very first issues tried to teach a group of people how to weave the strands of their Jewishness into, I would say, the texture of, of, Ameri of, of, Jewish, of American life. Um, they wanted to bring into being, you might say, sort of a culturally confident form of Jewishness that, that we take for granted today, but that, that did not exist uh, after the war. And then it sort of harvested the best fruits, literary and political, of, of that teaching. So, in other words, what I want to say is that by tracing two arcs of the magazine's trajectory, the political and the literary, it's possible to trace the story of this tumultuous Jewish love affair with America. It had its ups and downs like any love affair, but in the end it was an astonishingly successful post-war immigrant experience. After all, uh, these, the, 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 the people who brought commentary into being were um, you know, marginal, alienated, disaffected for the most part, people who believed in uh, so-called critical nonconformity. Um, and two generations later, somehow, by some alchemy, commentary stood in the mainstream of American culture and even of American conservatism as sort of a celebrant of the American regime. Uh, one way it did that is by demonstrating that Jewish matters could be talked about with the same rigor, the same intellectual seriousness as anything else. Uh, and so by doing that, sort of the magazine, its own posture, I would say, vis-a-vis -vis the world, stiffened by this, by this conviction that, that, you can, that Jews could participate fully in American life as Jews, it, by, by taking that posture, made itself to some of the best, made itself home to some of the best writing in English on Jewish literature, history, sociology, theology, you name it. So it offered a running commentary, for lack of a better term, uh, on sort of the great processions of the great, of the great decisive moments of post-war American life, from the Cold War to the lasting effects of totalitarianism on, on American politics, mm -hmm. to Vietnam and the counterculture, all the way up through 9-11 and, and what they would call World War IV. That is the war on terror. In the meantime, commentary was unique in the sense that unlike other opinion magazines, it was publishing fiction. And it was home to the early fiction of, of Philip Roth, um, some of the, many of the early stories of Bernard Malamud, Isaac Bashevis Singer for his first appearances in English, of course, Cynthia Ozick, who we'll get to later, as well as the very powerful literary criticism of people like Lionel Trilling and Alfred Kazin and Irving Howe. Um, it grappled with the Holocaust before almost anyone else in, in this country did. It was the first place to publish, for example, the Diary of Anne Frank in English. Uh, it published immensely significant uh, essays on Jewish theology by the likes of Gershom Sholem, uh, published on Jewish nationalism by Hannah Arendt, mostly critical, of course. It published in the 60s um, Norman Mailer's six-part series on Martin Buber's Tales of the Hasidim. I recommend that to you. Um, and by doing all of this, it became uh, not only one of the most important journals in Jewish history, but also, as I say, an incomparable barometer, you might say, of the climate uh, Jews came to enjoy in this country. So it was, the, the magazine was deeply representative in some respects and deeply unrepresentative in others, and we'll get to that later. But either way, I think it, it really served as this really sensitive register of the Jews, Jewish negotiation uh, with America. So what I thought I'd do is, um, is read a little bit uh, from the book as I try to explain some of its themes. Um, and the first thing that I wanted to read is uh, sort of how uh, 
I describe in the book sort of the alienation uh, and the sense of apartness that the people who founded Commentary felt. And then I explain how the twin shocks of the Holocaust and also the birth of the State of Israel affected their worldview and by extension the worldview of American Jews in general.